Hello, my name is Mark Mercola. I'm a professor of cardiovascular medicine at Stanford University. It's a pleasure to talk to you about using induced pluripotent stem cells, or iPSCs, for predicting and removing drug cardiotoxicity. This work has been supported for many years by SIRM. We're very grateful for that work in establishing this platform in my laboratory. So what is drug-induced cardiotoxicity? This is the unintended adverse effect of medicines on the electrical and or the mechanical function of the heart. This can be a very major problem for certain areas of medicine, such as oncology, where as many as a third of the patients who have been treated with oncology drugs will develop some form of heart disease as a consequence of their treatment. It's also a major problem for pharmaceutical companies. It's the major reason for drug attrition, drug failure during the development, and in some cases, even after market launch. So we are using iPS cells to try to address this problem. So what iPS cells are cells that we can derive from your skin or your blood, any other cell type in your body basically, by reprogramming them back to an embryological state. This is, was first done by Shinya Yamanaka based on work done by John Gurdon years before. And, this, and the technology for this won them the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2012. So once we have iPS cells, which resemble cells of the early embryo, we can direct their differentiation to different cell types in the body, such as heart muscle cells, brain cells, kidney cells, intestinal cells, and so on. And so you are able then to study disease because of course these cells retain the genetics of the original person, so if the person has a genetic disease, you hope that some manifestation of that disease will be reproduced in the laboratory. And we can also study the effect of drugs on those cells. So using this platform then, the work that I'm going to tell you about create, uses, I, creates muscle cell, heart muscle cells, and you can see that in the video on the slide. We treat those heart muscle cells with drugs or drug candidates, and in order to predict the adverse effects that those molecules will have on the heart, as well as to understand the influence of patient genetics, some people are much more susceptible than others to the adverse effect of drugs, and we also would like to use this platform to engineer safer drugs. So my talk today will be divided into three parts. I'll first talk about our recent work to develop efficient means of producing and increasing the fidelity of disease modeling in iPS cells. Secondly, I'll talk about using this platform to optimize an existing drug for a cardiac electrophysiologic disorder. And thirdly, I'll talk about our work to re-engineer an oncology drug to diminish its adverse effects. I'll start with the first part, producing cardiomyocytes efficiently and making better disease models. So when we began this work with serum funding back in 2008, it was only possible to make small numbers of cardiomyocytes, certainly nothing that could be used in high throughput drug screens. So with grants from the serum to John Cashman, a medicinal chemist at the Human Biomolecular Institute, and to me, at the, and I was in those days at the Sanford Burnham Prebis and Institute and at UCSD in San Diego, we developed a screening platform where we could look for compounds that would drive stem cells, in those days embryonic stem cells, to form cardio, cardiac muscle cells. And we hit upon a number of compounds that would do this. One of them is shown here. And these molecules are now the basis of nearly all efficient protocols to produce cardiomyocytes. More recently, we've been using this platform to advance the maturity of cardiomyocytes, uh, IPS cardiomyocytes. These cells, when they, if we form them in con by conventional means, are similar to cells of a very, very early embryo for a few weeks, a month or so into gestation. And that hampers disease modeling, so, which of course we're interested in the adult. So we learned that if we switch the energy substrates that the cells burn, so rather than burning sugar, they, we switch them to fat and other substrates, now we can drive the metabolic, the structural, and the electrophysiological uh, aspects of their maturation, and that improves their ability to model diseases as exemplified by dilated cardiomyopathy or an electrophysiological disorder, long QT syndrome type three. So now in the rest of the talk, I'm gonna talk about our efforts to use this platform for drug re-engineering. And the idea here is to make a better version of a drug that has some adverse effect on the heart of a patient that limits the, either the dosing or compromises the patient's health. And so the idea is that we would create heart cells from these people who have problems with some drug. 
We would then, in the dish, visualize the effect of that drug on the heart cells. And then we would, using high throughput screens, using robotic platforms, such as what you're seeing in the video, we would then develop better versions of those drugs, understand what to tweak in the drug to make it safer, and yet retain its activity. And that would then return that, the idea would be to return that drug through a pharmaceutical development pipeline back to the patient. But the problem when we wanted, when we started this, it was a rather audacious goal because IPS cardiomyocytes had never been used to drive a drug development campaign, certainly not patient cells where we were looking at a patient phenotype. So the question that we were all wondering is, will these assays in this platform be statistically robust enough to drive a medicinal chemistry exploration of a drug? And so we needed a test case. So with a Serum Early Translation 4 grant that was awarded to John Cashman and myself, we set about to re-engineer a drug that's used um, for a cardiac electrophysiology disorder, long QT3, and the drug was mixilatine. Um, we also in, uh, were grateful for the support of physiologists in New York and in Chicago, their labs of Rocky Cass and Al George. So what is long QT type 3? It's a rare genetic disease that causes ventricular tachycardia and sudden cardiac death, most commonly in teenagers and young adults. Its hallmark is that it has a prolongation of the QT interval on the surface electrocardiogram. Now, mixilatine will shorten that QT interval and thereby reduce the risk that the patient will develop a lethal arrhythmia. But the problem is that mixilatine at slightly higher doses than what's achieved in patients can also induce electrical problems in, a, in heart muscle cells. And although this isn't a huge problem clinically because these patients are very well managed, it nonetheless has induced concerns that it might induce or aggravate an arrhythmia. So even though it's not such a huge clinical problem, it's a wonderful test case for this platform because we can see the electrophysiological um, problems of cardiomyocytes quite clearly in these IPS cardiomyocyte assays. So we needed a patient. So Rocky Cass in New York and his clinical collaborators had identified a boy born with a particularly serious form of long QT3. He was actually diagnosed in utero and implanted with a dual chamber ICD that you can see here to control his, arrhyth his uh, arrhythmia. You can see the prolongation of the QT interval on the electrocardiogram, and he was treated uh, with mixilatine and responded quite well. So we then made IPS cardiomyocytes from this boy, and we wanted to record their electrical activity. And it's much like what is done in clinic with an electrocardiogram, but we do it optically, and you can see the beating of the cardiomyocytes, and here you can see a normal electrical activity of cardiomyocytes, and here you can see a rhythmic activity where you get a prolongation of the action, so-called action potential, and you get these extra spikes known as early after depolarizations. So using this platform and using IPS cardiomyocytes made from the boy, we were able to run through libraries of structural analogs of mixilatine and identify what would be the good and the bad determinants in those structures. So we were looking for molecules that would shorten the action potential, but mixilatine on its own, when you give it at too high doses, will cause pr prolongation and these after depolarizations, and that's bad. What we were able to do eventually was find four molecules that, that would uh, only shorten, but even at high concentrations, would not prolong. So we pr produced a safer version of the drug. And this molecule has worked in studies to block uh, the arrhythmia caused by long QT3. Now, uh, emboldened by that, we now set, apart, set out to do which is really what I've always wanted to do, which is to re-engineer on oncology drugs. These are, as I said, a serious problem. About a third of cancer survivors will suffer cardiac problems as a consequence of their treatment. It's not just old cancer drugs, but even the new molecularly targeted therapeutics that have this problem. We assembled a, a large team uh, co-directed by a medicinal chemist, Sanjay Malhotra at Stanford, and Ioannis Karakaikis, a stem cell biologist at Stanford. And these are the postdoctoral fellows, the trainees who worked on this project. So the drug we focused on was panotinib. It's used to treat chronic myelogenous leukemia because it inhibits the oncogene known as BCR ABL. Now, BCR ABL is mo in its normal form is inhibited by a, a, a relative of panotinib known as imotinib. That's rel that is a safe molecule. But unfortunately, a large number of patients under have a mutation that arises in the, in the BCR ABL gene and that mutation renders the, the, the protein insensitive to imotinib and all other first-line defense drugs for CML. 
Panotinib is the only effective drug against this mutation that's been approved. So whereas amotinib is safe, as I told you, panotinib is cardiotoxic. 8% of people who have taken it have developed heart failure. Many more have developed heart disease. But since amotinib is safe, we thought the, the problem with panotinib is an off-target effect. So we wanted to remove it. And the IPS platform is ideal for this because we don't need to know the actual reason why the drug is bad. We just need to know that it has bad effects that we can see in the dish. It's difficult to know the exact reason because these molecules target many, many proteins in the cell, at least 50 structurally related molecules to, to the uh, BCR ABL gene, and as many as three or four times as many non-kinase targets. So um, what we did was we took the structure of panotinib, we started tweaking parts of the compound in order to map the parts of the molecule that are important for its anti-tumor effects and important for the cardiotoxic effects of the drug. And we were guided by the structures of the relatively safe compound, amotinib. So we synthesized many analogs in an iterative process and tested them in parallel in IPS cardiomyocytes, in vascular cells which form tubes, and in the tumor cells, both normal uh, bcr able and mutated bcr able And the idea was to define the structural determinants for the good and the bad aspects of panotinib. And to cut to the chase, I'm going to show you ex two examples of improved molecules. And in this heat map representation here, red is bad and white is, is safe. And these are different indices of cardiotoxicity in the dish. Amotinib is white, so safe. Panotinib is red, so bad. And to these two analogs here, you can see are mostly white. And yet, when we, and when we can see that on the endothelial tumor uh, vasculogenesis assay, you can see that they do not disrupt the vasculature, whereas panotinib does, even at high doses. And yet they continue to block the, the um, growth of the tumor cells. The smaller number indicates better inhibition of the tumor. And so our new drugs, like panotinib, will inhibit. And even the mutant tumors with a mutant kinase, they will also inhibit. So, and this works not only in vitro, those prior data were in vitro, but it also works in vivo if we have tumors, human tumors, in mice. And by treating with panotinib or with our new drugs, we can reduce the tumor burden substantially. So what I've told you then is that in parallel, using cardiomyocytes, vascular assays, and tumor assays, we could engineer a safer version of the CML drug panotinib. We learned that there are different determinants for the good and bad aspects of the molecule, and that the new molecules that we've produced retain the anti-cancer effect, but have decreased cardiotoxic effects in vitro, and they have acceptable properties to go into animals, and they show anti-tumor activity against in xenograft models comparable to panotinib, but without the cardiotoxicity. This work, as I said, has been supported by SIRM funding specifically for these projects throughout the 10-year history, as well as it's been aided by SIRM training grants uh, to the Sanford Burnham, the Scripps Institute, the Salk Institute, and the University of California at San Diego. I directed the training grant at the Sanford Burnham. It's also been aided by SIRM infrastructure grants to the three those three institutions in San Diego. Thank you very much. Thank you.